So today is February 27th, 2012. This is AP Statistics at Berkeley High School. And we're going to finish up Chapter 11 right now, looking for inference for relationships. Okay, again, only two sections in this chapter. So in this section, we're, just, we're going to discuss um, the idea, again, of this I uh, uh, idea of an, an expected count given some assumption, some H naught assumption. Um, and we'll be looking at how that affects the calculation of uh, a chi-squared uh, a chi-squared test statistic. Uh, we are going to be checking to make sure that we meet the conditions uh, for running a chi-squared test under this uh, new situation. We'll perform the chi-squared test uh, for uh, association and independence, also called a chi-square test for homogeneity. Um, and then we'll follow up by looking at the individual com uh, contributors to the chi-square value to see if we can uh, spot where things are, gonna, are going kind of crazy. Um, and then we'll interpret the chi-square value and also interpret um, uh, not only getting the chi-square value out of your calculator, but we'll look at some computer printouts um, for chi-square as well. Okay, so let's tie this back to what we already know and then let's push forward with the new stuff. Okay, in chapter 10, we looked at two sample Z procedures. Now, what did that mean? We looked at two distinct populations and then we said of those two distinct populations, are you different? We ask, for example, we could ask the question, is there more left-handedness in females as compared to males? I think we asked the question, uh, is bridesmaid a chick flick? What's that? I, I, I live for the moments I get to spend with you guys. I, tie, I put them in my diary, and then I reread them every night. When I watch them. Okay. Anyway, so we ask questions, are these two populations different? And we use a, chi we use a, a Z procedure to either say, are these two means different? Are boys bigger than, taller than girls, for example? Or we could use the two prop Z test as, are these two proportions different? Is the proportion of females that are left-handed different than the proportion of females or males that are left-handed? We can ask questions based on two different populations based on either a single um, quantitative variable or a single categorical variable. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to look at two categorical variables simultaneously. All right? I want to ask a question of data, not based on a single categorical, but multiple categoricals at the same time. And then we're going to basically ask the question, are these two variables related somehow? Does one affect the other in some way? So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be doing that. But the first way we have to attack this problem is to say, how would we present data having to do with two categorical variables simultaneously? And the answer to that question is, we look at a two-way table. Now we've done two-way tables before. We've used them to organize, again, multiple categorical variables. And we get a list of categorical variables running across the top. Sorry, values at a single categorical variable running across the top. Values that a single categorical variable takes along, going along the other side. And then the intersection of those, we put counts. We put the number of things that meet both of those criteria. So, for example, here is a store that sells wine. A store that sells wine is trying to figure out, can I affect which wine gets sold based on which music I play. For example, if I play French music, do I, do I sell more French wine? If I play 
play Italian music, do I sell more Italian wine? Does it have an effect? Does this categorical variable, the music played, have an effect on this categorical variable, the wine that gets sold? Now, what we've done in the past, before we started introducing the chi-square, we simply said, can we do a distribution? Can we look at a distribution of, let's say, just these numbers? And we gave a name for that kind of particular kind of distribution. That would be a great time to chime in with the name of that thing, of that distribution. Okay, a follow-up with a different question. How many of you went to bed after midnight last night? Oh, about half of you. How many of you average going to bed after 1 a.m. each day this past week? Average. Okay, so you guys are sleepy, is that correct? Probably. Probably. You're too sleepy to figure out whether you're sleepy or not. I appreciate your honesty. Now would be a good time to pay attention, though. Right? Try this one more time. What's that word that begins with an M and ends in an arginal that describes this kind of distribution? Oh, a marginal distribution. Thank you. Okay? And remember, there are two marginal distributions. Right? Two marginal distributions, defined on the margins. Great. Would that help us figure out whether there's a relationship between the music played and the wine purchased, though? Not really, because all we're seeing on those numbers is, oh, 84 bottles, sorry, 84, 84 bottles of wine were purchased when no music was played, while 75 bottles were purchased while French music was played, Italian, you might be able to get an idea whether more wine gets sold, but not whether more French wine gets sold when French music is played. Over here, we can see that French, Italian, other wine, they have their distribution, but we have no idea what's going on in terms of the, the music part. Okay, so the marginal distribution, not real helpful. Well, what about that other kind of distribution that goes on with two-way tables. That distribution, for example. A conditional. A conditional. So I don't have to say it starts with C and ends in unditional. Yeah. OK. So the conditional distribution gives us a little bit of insight, right? When no music was played, we got 30, we got 11, we got 43 <coughs> bottles of wine sold. But that doesn't give us a, lot, a whole picture. That alone doesn't give us a lot of insight. I could look at this one. Maybe that doesn't. It tells me that very little Italian wine got sold when French music was playing. But is that an, a, a very strange amount of Italian wine not being sold? Don't know. Maybe the conditional distribution that we need to look at is going that way. Was there big changes going that way? Hard to tell. What we're entering in is a situation where it's hard to look at either of these distributions and get the whole story. We need to look at this whole distribution at once. And that's where the, the chi-square distribution is going to come in. Let's see. Come on. Let's start with an idea. There's the distribution of how the wine was sold. That's what I'll call observed. Now, when we started talking about chi-square last two weeks ago, 
we said we compare the observed to something called expected. I observed 12 brown M&Ms. I expected, given that there were 54 M&Ms in my bag, I expected a certain number of brown M&Ms, and I could look at the change between those two numbers. I need something called an expected matrix, expected, expected two-way table. How much wine, French wine, do I expect to sell? Given some H naught claim. Well, going through the conditional distributions, which I don't <coughs> really want to spend any time looking at. There's those conditional distributions based on when music was played. Anything pop out at you? The middle one? When French music is playing, very little Italian wine is sold? That's unusual. Anything else? In general, there's less Italian wine being sold, but the most Italian wine was sold when Italian music was being played. Okay. Now, these are subjective things. That looks strange, says Kyle. No one likes Italian wine, says Katja. Oh, she didn't say that. You can say it now. Okay. All right. But those are subjective. What I need is some sort of objective way of measuring this. I need some way of saying, how can we quantify how unusual that amount of Italian wine being sold when French music is being played? How do we quantify that? How do we get a number to that? <coughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and let's see if we can dive in to the idea of an expected count and then doing a chi-square uh, statistic having to do with that. Okay. Now, in the last example of chi-square, chi-square goodness of fit, the one that you took your quiz on, the one that you got your quiz back today on, right? on the chi-square goodness of fit, we said I compare observed to expected based on some H dot claim. In the goodness of fit test, that H dot claim was, here's a model that we think represents what's going on. Right? We need a new H naught claim for this new kind of problem that we're doing. Right? And if you have your cheat sheet out, you can take a look at what that new H naught claim is. The H naught claim is these two variables are independent. Or these two variables don't affect each other. Or these two variables have no relationship. So or to use the term that we've been using with um, with other problems, there is no difference between wine sales when Italian music is played or, mu or French music is played or no music is played. We don't see any difference. Now, that flies in the face with what Kyle said. He thinks he does see a difference. But again, what he saw was subjective. Let's see if we can quantify how far away that Italian sales was from what was, would be expected, assuming there should be no difference. All right. And so what we're going to do is that we are going to make an expected matrix based on the idea that there is no difference. Um, let me see if I can take you through the calculation for that, that, uh, that claim. All right. We can see in the two-way table that 99 of the, 400 and, of the 243 bottles sold were French wine. Okay? Now, 
we can also see that 84 bottles of wine were sold when no music was playing. So far so good? This 99 out of 4 of 243 gives us an idea of what fraction of all wine sold is French no matter what's going on. If the music play has no effect on which wine is purchased, this proportion, actually probably easy if we thought of that as a, a percentage. Can someone quickly throw that on your calculator? 99 divided by 243? 41%. Okay. So we expect we expect 41% of all wine being sold to be French. Right? Well, how about 41% of 84? Thirty-four point four four. Great. So under the category none and under the the category French wine, no music French wine, we expect thirty-four bottles of French wine to be sold. Thirty-four point four four. Why? Because it's forty-one percent of that eighty-four. Now I didn't take into account that the music has an effect. I'm just saying. If nothing special is going on, about that number of bottles of red, uh, French wine should be sold. Let's try it again. How about this? How about 41% of this 75? 30.75. And then I'll do it one more time. How about 41% of that 84? Is that? 34.44 again. Okay, yep. In fact, the first column and the last column are going to be exactly the same in, for all of this. So again, these numbers, what do they represent? They represent how many French bottles of French wine I would expect to sell if nothing special is going on. It's just the 41% of the number of bottles of wine that were sold with that music or with that music or with that music. Okay? Now, that's only three of the numbers in the expected matrix. What do I have to do next? I have to do the same thing with the Italian wines. So if the Italian wines sold at a different rate, they seem to be less popular. How much less popular? Well, whoops, try that again. 31 out of 243 bottles that were sold were Italian, and that's about 13%. And then what am I going to do with that 13%? I'm going to say, well, what's 13% of that 84? 10 what? 10.92. How about 13% of that 75? Nine 9.75. Okay? And then... The last one is going to end up being exactly the same, 13% of 84. So now, here's how much Italian wine I expected to sell if the music had no effect. It's just certainly, simply 13% of all the wine sold when that music was playing. And by the way, if I add these three numbers up, I get exactly 31. If I add these three numbers up, I get exactly 99. I'm not creating a matrix with new margins, I'm changing the inside saying, if there was no effect, this is what will go on. Okay, last time through. And that is other wine. The other, the other category takes up 113 out of 243. 113 out of 243. What percentage is that? 46%. And now what do I say? Amongst the wine sold when there was no music played, I expect 46% of it to be other wine. The Californias, the... Other places they make wine. Well, I mean, they make wine in Michigan. Spain. Spain.
Spain, oh, Spain, of course. Uh, Germany, Germany's got some very nice wine. Portugal. Portugal? I don't think I've ever had a Portuguese wine. <laughs> All right, so 40, so four, I, I don't think they make wine in Morocco. So 46% of this 84 is going to be other wine. Give me that number, Abby. 38.64. 38.64. And that 38.64 is going to be there too. And then, four, what's that? 34.5. Okay. And again, this new list of numbers is called the expected matrix. And it's based on... What do we expect if there was no relationship, if both these things had no effect? Now we can start actually quantifying what Kyle said. Hey, when French music was playing, we only sold one bottle of Italian wine. How many did we expect to sell? Almost 10. Is that a big difference? Sure. Are there any other numbers that are wildly different? Oh. When Italian music was playing, we sold 19 bottles of Italian wine. How many did we expect to sell? Almost 11. Is that a big difference? Okay. And so we can start looking for differences between the observed and the expected matrices, and then we're going to see what stands out. All right. Let me erase all of this because we're going to go on, right? And then here's them just saying the same kind of calculation that, they just, that, that we just did. So those are the same calculations that we did. There's the Italian wines, and there's the uh, other wines. Okay? So, nothing different than what we just did. Okay? The good news is, as hard as, hard as we worked just now, there's a really simple formula for doing those calculations. Now, we did it in two steps. I showed a proportion, and then I multiplied that proportion by a, a column total. Calculation could be summarized. Okay, just to go through. Here's what we did. We calculated this particular part. Got a proportion that was the 40 some percent. And then we multiplied it by 84 to get that expected number. But you know what? We could have just as easily found this proportion. and multiplied it by 99. The, co the calculation for finding these expected values can simply be summarized as row total multiplied by column total divided by total total, grand total. And that's going to be true for every position in the expected matrix. You want to find the expected value for that particular position? It's going to be 75 multiplied by 99 all divided by 243. Okay, row total times column total divided by grand total or table total as I guess they're calling it. Relatively easy formula. But even this, I'm going to give you a gift. My gift to you, your calculator will calculate all those expected values for you. I'll show you how to do that in a second. All right? But there's nothing magical about where those numbers are coming from. Row total times column total divided by grand total. You ready to move on? So, 
We've got an observed matrix. That's what actually was sold. We have an expected matrix, uh, a matrix that describes what we would have got sold if there was no effect between music and wine sold. And if we want to go ahead and do the chi squared statistic, then we need to check our conditions. All expected counts have to be at least five. Hey, that's the same condition it was for chi squared goodness of fit. That should be easy to remember. Oh, random conditions. The random condition must be in place. Oh, so our data is collected in an unbiased fashion. Okay, and we we deal with that by saying um, was the was the choice of when the music was played, which music was played, was that randomly selected? I know, I'm trying to think of on what occasion would more French wine be sold than Italian? Well, certainly around New Year's. What do you drink at New Year's? Sorry, what do adults drink at New Year's? What's that? Okay, let's stick specifically with wine. What kind of wine do you drink on New Year's? What kind of wine? Do you drink champagne? Why is it called champagne? Because it's from the Champagne region of France. So you drink French wine. You drink French wine. So, 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 because because that may be having an effect on which wine is being sold. What you need to do is randomize what music is being played when. You can't just say, yeah, I think French now. You have to say, I'm going to roll a die. Oh, okay, uh, it says right here, three. That's French music being played now. Oh, I roll a one. Oh, no music being played right now. Roll a two. Oh, Italian music. You have to randomize what kind of music is being played. Okay, for fear that you're really measuring some other relationship that's going on. All right. Now we didn't. They were. They didn't tell us how they decided which music was being played when. So we have to proceed with caution there. Okay. And then lastly, what are the elements that are going to go into calculating the chi square value? And the answer is going to be observed minus expected squared divided by expected, and then add up all those values. Oh, in other words, it's the same calculation that we did last time. You're going to take the observed minus the expected, you're going to get a number. That number may be positive or negative. We'll square it to make it positive. And then we'll divide by expected because big changes away from small values have a larger effect than big changes away from larger values. Remember the analogy was um, uh, Paul's party with 500 people and 10 people not showing up. And who else had the party? And the, Nicole had the small party, and 10 people didn't show up. One of them was insignificant. One of it was significant. OK, so we divide by the expected value, because when you differ a lot from a large value, it doesn't have as much effect as if you differ a lot from a small value. All right, so let's finish this off. Here we have it. We've got the observed counts. Based on those observed counts, we created this matrix of expected counts. And then for each value in the one matrix, we end up calculating a contributor to the chi-square value. 30 minus 34.12. Square that. Divide it by 34.22. And that gives you a contributor to the chi-square value of 0.52. That's only one of the nine contributors to chi-square in this particular problem. Do that again and again and again, and we end up getting a chi-square value of 18.28. Now it's time to get out your chi-square table. I'll get my chi-square table out too. Okay, get your chi-square table out, and let's re re recall what we know about the chi-square table. Um, we know that the chi-square table has this column for degrees of freedom, and 
And we need to now talk about what does degrees of freedom mean in this instance. How many degrees of freedom do we have in this 3 by 3 matrix? 4 says Abby. On what did you base that, that, cal that calculation? Oh, on the, on the, okay. On the cheat sheet, it says degrees of freedom is the number of rows multiplied by the number of, sorry, number of rows minus 1 multiplied by the number of columns minus 1. Okay? And it is. In this case, it will be 4 degrees of freedom. But I want you to go back to that other definition I had for degrees of freedom. How much information do you need to know before you have all the information required about a particular item? I could say, hey, you know what? I sold a bottle of wine. And if I told, I told you the music that was playing was not French and not Italian. I told you two pieces of information. The music, that, the music was not French and not Italian. Can you tell me what was playing? Nothing. OK? No, no, I, the music was non-Italian or French. OK, I sold a bottle of wine. The <laughs> bottle of wine was neither from the other category, and it wasn't from the French category. Italian. Italian. OK, so in other words, if I tell you two pieces of information about the music category, you know that it has to land in, you, have to, you know what kind of music it was. If I tell you two pieces of information from what kind of wine was sold, you know what kind of, you have, you have complete information. Telling you two out of the three gives you complete information about music. Telling you two out of the three gives you complete information about, about what wine was sold. Okay, so the degrees of freedom in this case is two times two or four. So let's go ahead and look at the chi square value having to do with, with four degrees of freedom. Now chi-square value as they calculated was 18.28. So we look on our four degrees of freedom line for 18.28, and we would say it would fall somewhere in that range. From there, we look up to our p-values, and we say the p-value for that range of chi-square values is between 0.0025 and 0.001. That's below alpha. If alpha is our typical 0.05, we should reject each one. We should reject. Go. That's a great question. We should reject each one. See how that this you've, you've got these procedures down very well. What was H naught again? No, that's alpha. What was H naught? So <laughs> that there's no difference in wine sales. <coughs> that there's no relationship between music and what wine got sold. Wait, you're rejecting that. You're rejecting the statement there is no difference between music and wine. Music doesn't affect There is a difference. So therefore, there is a difference, and music does affect which wine got sold. There we go. And that's how that all plays, plays, plays out. Okay. So if we meet our conditions, remember we, we were hesitant on the, the random part of the, of the condition. We reject that there is no difference between the distribution of the categor categorical variables. We found the p-value. Somewhere in here, see, do we have everything? Scaffolding sheet says there is no difference. We've got that. HA is that there is a difference. We calculated a chi-square value. We calculated the degrees of freedom. We found the p-value. So the p-value is between 0.0025 and 0.001. And that leads us to the final conclusion. Because there's a small p-value, we reject H0. We believe that there is a difference, or we, we believe that there is an effect on what music is played on the kinds of why kind of wine being sold. And because of the experiment, we can actually say that this difference is caused by the music. Alright?
Let's try it again. But this time we're going to use our calculators. We're going to do the work in a little bit more streamlined way. So random digit dialing surveys uh, are used to exclude. So let me try that again. Random digit dialing is used to exclude phone no cell phone numbers. If the opinions of people who only have cell phone or phone cell phones differ from those people who have landline service, the poll results may not represent the entire adult population. So the Pew Research Center interviewed two separate samples, one of cell phone only people and one of landline only people uh, who are less than 30 years old, and here's what we got. If we ask the question, do you, are you Democratic, or do you are you a Democrat, or do you lean Democratic? Do you refuse to lean either way? Are you Republican or lean? Do you lean, lean Republican? By the way, this is kind of funny because tomorrow is the um, Michigan uh, primary, and one I got called last week on a robocall on my landline asking me who my preferences who my preference was for the Republican candidate. And, uh, and do I plan on voting in the primary? Cool. I'm sorry? Are you 18? Yeah. Are you registered to vote? No. Well, that's going to be a problem. <laughs> So anyway, so I got that robocall, call, and it's funny, you know, it's, so I'll, I'll play, I'll play along, and I told them who I would vote for if I was voting in the Republican primary. Um, I said I'd vote for Romney. I think he is the least bad of those four, of the four guys that are remaining in the race. Okay. And then I got a robocall call yesterday inviting me to a rally for Romney at the Royal Oak Music Theater that's being held today. No, I am not going to a rally for Romney. I have no idea. I have no idea. But it's like what the call went on and said, if you want to, if you want to go attend the rally, you have to RSVP or call this number. So anyway, that was kind of funny. So anyway, do we think there's a difference between cell phone people and non-cell phone people in terms of their, their preference? If you look at the stacked bar chart, does there seem to be a difference? In the middle. The refuse to lean any, either way seems to be bigger in the landline group than the... Do we, do we think that perhaps the proportion of, this must be, the top one must be Republican, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. You think it's, you think it's a, you think it's, they look different. Do they look significantly different? No. no. What about for refuse to learn, lean either way? Yes. They look, that looks different, it looks significantly different. Okay. And then these two? Mm. Eh. Okay. So here's a question. Well, actually, here's an insight. We could do a one-prop Z test, sorry, a two-prop Z test to test to see whether the middle is significantly different. But what we can do instead is that we can do this chi-square test, and that, that only tests whether the refuse to lean either way difference is significant. It tests if there are any significance between any of the three. It tests all three simultaneously. <coughs> so let's go ahead, let's get out our calculators, and let's take a look at calculating the chi-square value um, using, using technology and not doing it all by hand. Okay. So we are going to need to have a place to put the data in uh, that we've collected. That place when we did the goodness of fit test at 11.1 was two lists. We created an observed list and we created an ex uh, expected list. All right. For this thing called the chi-square test of homo homogeneity or test of independence, we don't have lists, we have matrices. 
And so we are going to have to look under a second matrix to find a place to put in our data. So would you do that for me right now? Go to the second matrix button and you get this menu. And here's where it gets a little bit tricky. All right? We need to put the data into the matrix. So we need to go over to the edit menu. And then we got to say, well, where are we going to put this data? Oh, we'll put it in the A matrix. And that gives us a matrix into which we can enter the data. Now, here's the second thing. They, matrices have dimensions. And right now, it's set as a one-by-one one matrix. But how, how, do, how does our data look? It's either three by two or two by three. Okay. RC. Okay. Matrix. Matrix. Matrices. Matrices are radio controlled. The row. The row number comes first. So there are three rows. There are two columns. This is a three by two matrix. Now, if you get it wrong, it'll look wrong on your screen. So don't worry too much about that. But now we've got the six places to put in our observed data. 49, enter. 47, enter. 15, enter. 27, enter. 32, enter. And 30, enter. All right, there we go. We've got our data in. Okay, now expect it. Well, let me do a second quick. The procedure for finding the expected matrix is easy. Row total, column total, divided by total total. Guess what calculator can do this for you very easily? This one. Actually, even the old 83s will do this. We don't have to put in the expected matrix. It will calculate it for us. Let's go to stats, test, and let's go to the one that says chi-square test. Remember, not goodness of fit. All right? Now, here's what the screen is saying. Let me, let me make it nice and big for you. Here's what the screen is saying. Hey, you where is your observed data? We say the observed data is in matrix A. Hey you, where do you want me to put the expected matrix once I calculate it for you? You say, B would be fine. And that's it. And then we hit calculate. Can it figure out what the degrees of freedom is? Yeah. Or degrees of freedom are? Okay, we'll go, all right, and the answer is, yeah, it knows the size of the matrix. It can calculate that the degrees of freedom is 2, and we hit enter, and that's it. The chi-square value is 3.1, or 3.22. The p-value is 0.19. And, of course, you know how to interpret that p-value already. Because that p-value is larger than 0.05, we fail to reject H0. There's insufficient evidence to suggest that there's a difference in political preference based on whether you have a cell phone or a landline. And it tells you the degrees of freedom is 2. What could be easier? Now, do you remember back in step 2, there's this condition called large number for large sample. Is that listed there? <laughs> we said that in order to, to do this test legitimately, we have to have a sample size large enough that none of the expected numbers can be less than five. Oh, maybe we do have to calculate the expected matrix by hand to find out whether they're less than five. 
Or maybe we could just look at the B matrix, the place that we told it to put the matrix, and see if it's there. Second matrix. Go down to B, hit Enter. And hit Enter again. There we go. There are all the expected numbers that it calculated so nicely for us. Do we pass the large sample uh, condition? Yeah. yeah, because every single expected number is larger than 5. Hooray. Jazz hands. What's that? So do we get this idea? We get this procedure? This is actually an easier procedure than the goodness of fit test, isn't it? We only have to put one set of numbers in. It does all the heavy lifting. And the conditions are actually the same. Easy. All right, let's finish up the discussion on this one. Let's remind ourselves that in step one, our, our question is, what population, are we, what, popu, what, are, what population are we looking at? We're looking at what? People under 30. What are the variables that we're looking at? Do they have a cell phone or landline? So we'll call it phone preference and then political preference. What's our null hypothesis? And the chi this chi-square test of homogeneity is always one doesn't affect the other. We don't think that there's an effect between phone and political preference. That's our null hypothesis. What is our alternate hypothesis? There is an effect. There is some sort of relationship. And then alpha value 0.05. See, conditions, random, or unbiased, as we usually call it. Do they use a random sample to, to choose who they, who they talk to? They say yes, we're good. Do we have a large sample? Yes, we looked at the expected matrix. All those numbers are bigger than five. Big check mark there. Okay, and independent. Do we think the number of people with landlines is bigger than the... 10 times the number of our sample. At least 10 times as large. Sure. Do we think the people with cell phones is at least 10 times as large as our sample? Sure. All right. So we meet all the conditions. There's them doing it by hand. There's them calculating a p-value of 20%. And then our last conclusion, because the p-value is so large, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. There's insufficient evidence to suggest that there's a relationship between cell phone use and political <coughs> preference. OK. Now, the last part. The chi-square value and its associated p-value tell us whether there is or isn't a difference. The thing it doesn't tell us is which way that difference goes. Go back to the original example. Kyle says, I see a change in the number of Italian wine bottles sold. The chi-square value being large and its p-value being so small didn't tell you that it was Italian that was, that was out of whack. All it did was say, there is a problem. There is a discrepancy, but it doesn't tell you where. If this particular problem had a significant result, it says the result is significant. It doesn't tell you that it's those people in the no preference area that was the thing that was significant, that caused the big result. So I want you to be wary. The chi-square tells you there is, a pro there is a relationship, but it doesn't tell you where the relationship are, is or how that relationship works. It just tells you something's, something's going on there. There is some relationship. Okay. Now, something that your calculator does not do for you is tell you the contributors to the chi-square value. Okay. You put the data in and observe. You get the expected date matrix out, but it doesn't tell you where the contributors are, like we saw in the goodness of fit test. Now, you can probably barely see it. If you use a statistical program like Minitab, 
you put your data in, it kicks out this information. In blue, all these circles, those are your observed. In red, all those numbers, those are your expected. And like your calculator, it'll calculate the expected matrix for you. And then lastly, in green, those are the contributors. Those are the elements that when you add them all up, you get your chi-square value. Why would this be helpful? Well, Kyle comes and says, take a look at that number right there, 7.6. 7-2. That's the biggest number in the contributors area. <coughs> Just like Kyle had said, that was where it looked like it was most off. It was most different than what we expected. Here's the information that allows you to say that. Yeah, Megan. I'd like to move over. Oh, sure. Okay, how are we doing? Uh, we are only halfway through, although we hit the major points. Here's what I'm going to do. We're going to finish. We're going to finish this lecture tomorrow. We're going to delay the quiz to Wednesday, and we're going to delay the test to Friday. All right? That'll I think work out well for everyone. Um, the homework is up online. Let me see if I. Okay. So if you want to get started on it, you may. And then we'll finish up the lecture. You probably have some time to do homework in class tomorrow. So um, bring your books. I rarely ask you to do that. Bring them and you'll have some time in class to do homework.